Okay, well, hello, everybody. It really is a pleasure to be here today. It's um, always a pleasure to speak at the Oli Foundation meeting and to share this podium with such uh, distinguished faculty. So I am going to talk about um, short bowel syndrome and how to eat when you can't eat. I have some disclosures here, none of which will impact um, this presentation. So I have one objective, it's a big one, but to describe the dietary interventions to enhance absorption and reduce output. Now, this is the standard American diet. It's really high in sugar, it's high in fat. Now, if you have short bowel syndrome, can you actually imagine eating this way? You may want to eat that way, but this is likely to cause a significant increase in output, either in your ostomy effluent or causing you to run in the bathroom and have a bowel movement. So how do we tip the scales? In other words, how can we increase absorption and decrease output? Well, I think and when it comes to short bowel syndrome, I might be slightly biased, but I think diet forms the foundation of therapy. It is the most potent stimulus to intestinal adaptation that we are aware of. And the nutrition prescription has to be based on the GI anatomy. So let's talk about this a little bit. I really would like to acknowledge my colleagues, um, Teresa Byrne and Doug Wilmore, because they really did this pioneering work in trying to figure out how we can enhance absorption. And the diet really needs to be based on whether or not the colon is in circuit. In other words, do you have a bowel movement through the rectum to where your colon is attached or do you have an ostomy? So let's look at this a little bit more carefully. I wanna start out with carbohydrates. Now, the recommendations are actually fairly similar whether you have a colon or no colon. Um, they, if you have a colon in circuit, it's 50 to 60% of the calories and to really limit simple sugars. When the colon is absent and you have an ostomy, um, it's about 40 to 50% of total calories and we really want you to restrict simple sugars. So what is a simple sugar versus a complex carbohydrate? Simple sugars are short chain carbohydrates, things like sugar, candy, cakes, cookies, pies, soda pop, here in the South, sweet tea, jelly, jam, syrup, ice cream, sherbet, sorbet, a lot of what people would consider the goodies. Now, the complex carbohydrates these are things that are generally well tolerated when you have short bowel, pasta, potato, bread, cereals, whole grains is tolerated. This is where it gets a little individualized. Not everybody can tolerate whole grains and fruits and vegetables as tolerated. So what about non-nutritive sweeteners? Okay, so I just said you really can't use a lot of sugar. And most of us have a little bit of a sweet tooth. You can use um, these non-nutritive sweeteners, things like Sweet and Low, Equal, Splenda, um, Stevia, they are all fine. They're very concentrated, so a little goes a long way. Um, I typically recommend Stevia uh, initially, as long as you like the taste. Um, because we think it has the least amount of negative impact on the gut microbiota. But any of these are acceptable to use in short bowel. The one thing that we do ask you to avoid are the sugar alcohols. And you'll know that because you'll see a little OL at the end. So things like sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol, these things actually cause more diarrhea and more ostomy output. 
And even if you have all of your bile in circuit, if you take enough of these sugar alcohols, you will end up with diarrhea. So that's something you really should avoid. And you typically find these in like diabetic candies and cookies and things like that. So you need to be very careful. So going back to the diet prescription, let's look at protein. Notice for whether or not your colon is in circuit or not, it's 20 to 30% of total calories. So it's a pretty big slug. And we want our clients to have a fairly high protein diet. So there are different types of protein. And whenever possible, it's good to focus on the high biological value proteins, things like whey, of course, human milk, but chicken eggs, um, you know, meat, fish, poultry, these tend to be high biological value proteins. When you get into the vegetable proteins like tofu, um, I'm not saying they're not healthy, but it isn't as high biological value as meat, fish, poultry, eggs. So what about fat? Now, if your colon is in circuit, you do have to limit it. Now, it doesn't mean that the diet is fat free, but you do have to limit it. When your colon is not in circuit, that is you have an ostomy, then you can be a little bit more liberal. But in each case, we try to focus on some of the essential fats. So fat should be included in the diet because we need some fat. It prevents essential fatty acid deficiency. It's a carrier of fat soluble vitamins and it is a source of energy. But again, not all fats are the same. And we want you to focus on the essential fatty acids. Foods that are high in animal fat and saturated fats should probably be limited since they have been associated with atherosclerosis and other cardiac diseases. So you probably have heard a lot about omega-3 fatty acids versus omega-6. And it's good to have a little bit of a balance, but in general, the omega-3 fatty acids primarily from fish have anti-inflammatory um, properties, whereas omega-6 fatty acids that are derived from things like butter and animal fats, these are more pro-inflammatory. So essential fatty acids versus non-essential. And here you'll see a list of these foods. The healthier things, canola oil, cold water fish, and these like salmon, trout, mackerel, sardines, these are the fats that are very high in the omega-3s. Corn oil, flaxseed, grapeseed, mayonnaise, safflower, soybean, and sunflower. The non-essential fats are listed off to the right, butter, cocoa butter, coconut oil, palm, peanut, red meat, whole, meat, whole milk, and cheeses. Now, I'm not saying you can never have a little bit of butter on your bagel, but um, you, know, you really should probably try and limit these, especially things like palm oil, coconut oil. Um, these are the types of oils that will really clog your arteries. Okay, let's move into fluids. Now this gets a little bit more complex. If your colon is in circuit, people do best with isotonic fluids or hypoosmolar fluids. If the colon is not in circuit, then isotonic high sodium oral rehydration solutions. It sounds a little complex, so let's look at that more closely. Here you see the types of fluids. The hyperosmolar fluids, these contain some glucose and little to no sodium. What happens is when you drink these things like Coke, Pepsi, Mountain Dew, sweet tea, and I don't mean to zero in on any particular type of soda, but these are the regular soda pops. What happens is they um, are very hyperosmolar. So they cause fluid to be pulled into the intestine that, to try and dilute the concentration of that beverage. 
And when that fluid hits the inside of the bowel, it causes you to have diarrhea. The hypoosmol osmol, uh, fluids contain little to no particles of glucose and sodium, so they're not concentrated. These are things like water, decaffeinated and sugar-free beverages. They are not always absorbed entirely and they are known as free fluids. The isoosmolar fluids, these are the ones that typically work best if you have an ostomy. They contain sodium, potassium, glucose in the same concentration as blood and your extracellular fluid. They will not cause fluid to shift into the GI tract. Oral rehydration solutions, things like Cerolite, Pedialyte, uh, Gatorade 2 are some examples. Um, and this is usually the beverage of choice for those with short bowel syndrome. And when I say beverage of choice, I don't necessarily mean that you love it, but it, these are the fluids that tend to help you absorb more. So let's look at this. Now, here are some common beverages, you know, things like prune juice, grape juice, apple juice, orange juice, even regular soda pop. You can see that the osmolarity is actually pretty high and they are hyperosmolar. And then when you get into diet soda, it's zero. Water is very low. Sugar-free tea are very low. Um, so those are the hypoosmolar. The oral rehydration salts, Cerolite, Pedialyte, Gatorade, um, these tend to be isoosmolar. So again, if you have an ostomy, you're gonna wanna focus more on the isoosmolar beverages. So the reason why these work is the oral rehydration solutions take advantage of what we call the sodium glucose co-transport system. So you need a certain ratio of glucose and sodium to maximize absorption. And this was a small study, but they looked at sodium balance in people with short bowel syndrome. And as you can see, if the sodium content is only 60 millimoles per liter, that's about 60 milliequivalents per liter, um, you don't get positive balance. You get very good balance at 120 millimoles per liter, but that's really salty and it's kind of like drinking ocean water. So at 90, I think you get some reasonable absorption um, and they don't taste too bad. So again, here are some examples. Of course, the World Health Organization oral rehydration solution, their standard formula notice is 20 grams of carbohydrate per liter and 90 milliequivalents of sodium. They also have a reduced osmolality formula. Now, one thing I wanna point out, if you compare that World Health Organization, ORS, to Gatorade, standard Gatorade, notice that the concentrations are almost opposite of what they should be. The World Health Organization solution has 20 grams of carbohydrate per liter, but Gatorade only has, or has 60. And the World Health Organization has 90 milliequivalents of sodium per liter, but only 20 uh, in the Gatorade. So you can doctorate this up a little bit. If you use Gatorade 2, G2, and you add a little bit of salt, you can make that concentration closer to the World Health Organization formula. And this is something that um, you would probably do well with. And the G, a lot of people like G2, they have very nice flavors, fancy flavors. So that might be an option for you. So when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, we made our own oral rehydration solutions and this is what we used. Um, so you'll have this reference. Um, here's another very common recipe for oral rehydration solutions. 
and you can make your own with just ordinary ingredients from your kitchen, things like salt and sugar and baking powder or baking soda, that's um, a source of bicarbonate. And um, if you need potassium, that also can be added. And I've had patients who think this tastes fine. Um, and if you don't like the flavor, you can add an artificial flavoring, things like crystal light or something like that, or a non nutritive sweetener. So here are some other options that you can use um, using just standard Gatorade, grape juice or cranberry juice, notice, or even apple juice, notice that if you add some additional water and some salt, you can make that sodium and carbohydrate content a little closer to the or World Health Organization ORS. Okay, so let's talk about fiber. Fiber is really an interesting thing. Um, if you're constipated, it can make you go. And if you have diarrhea, it can bulk things up. So in general, in if you have a colon, fiber is actually really important, particularly the soluble fibers, because once that fiber gets into the colon, the bacteria in the colon can metabolize that fiber um, into short chain fatty acids, which is used as an energy source. And it also is helpful in terms of intestinal adaptation. But even if you don't have a colon, um, I think fiber can be very helpful. It helps to gelatinize the ostomy effluent. In other words, it's, it can thicken up your ostomy output so you have a little bit more control over it. We do get fiber in food, believe it or not. Um, so you don't have to just take it in the form of a supplement, you can. But the soluble fibers are things like oatmeal, um, oat bran, um, some fruits like apples without the skin, okay? So you could just eat the inside, uh, applesauce, bananas, and you know other fruits. Cooked, peeled, and or seedless vegetables. Uh, most people with short bowel do best with cooked vegetables. And again, I'm not saying you can never have raw vegetables, but more than likely you will do better if they are cooked. Refi refried low fat beans, shell beans um, as tolerated. The insoluble fibers, these are things that you probably will need to limit because you may have difficulty digesting them. And it's not uncommon to see bits and pieces of the food come out in your ostomy bag or in the toilet bowl. Okay, what about meals? Now, if you have short bowel syndrome, most of you probably have already figured out you cannot sit down and eat an enormous typical Western meal because it'll come right out in your ostomy or um, it'll make you run to the bathroom. So smaller frequent meals are generally better tolerated. So, the types of foods and the way the food is consumed affects your absorption. So again, from the work of Byrne and colleagues, this shows two different diets. They both have 2,400 calories, 50% carbohydrate, 20% protein, 30% fat. This is the way a short bowel patient should be eating on the left. Now notice, if you have short bowel, you can have breakfast and a mid-morning snack. But if you try to eat the food, the breakfast on the right, you are probably gonna have to eat that in the bathroom because that's where you're going to end up. Lunch, and again, I think that these are reasonable. Um, some baked ham, some rice, carrots, dinner roll, a little bit of margarine and something to drink. But what's not recommended is having a slice of pizza and a regular soda pop. That is likely to trigger output. And then dinner and an evening snack. 
Um, so you can see that if you break up the meals so that you have, you know, maybe six small feedings in a day, you will actually um, enhance your absorption. And I think that this is a reasonable meal and, and I think it's fairly palatable. So putting it all together, how do you do this? First of all, I want to say I am absolutely the most liberal dietitian you will ever meet. And I want our clients to enjoy their food. And there's a lot of variation. So, you know, I've never seen two short bowel patients who were exactly alike. So there's some wiggle room in here. But of course, I would ask that you plan a reasonably balanced diet include complex carbohydrates, you know, bread, pasta, cereals, proteins, and fats at each meal. I think it's wise that you limit or avoid simple sugars, things like table sugar, candies, cakes, pies, cookies, regular soda pop, sweet tea. Those things are gonna trigger a bowel movement or um, an increase in ostomy output. Try and distribute the food throughout the day, okay? Just small frequent meals tend to work best. Digestion begins in the mouth, so chew your food well. If you don't, you are likely to see undigested food particles in your ostomy bag or in the toilet bowl. Use salt liberally, especially if your colon is in circuit. Where most Americans, we want them to lim limit their salt. If you have short bowel, using salt actually helps you absorb better. Again, taking advantage of that sodium glucose co-transport system. Now, I'm not saying you have to salt the food to the point where you can't eat it and it's unpalatable, but I find that many patients with short bowel actually crave salt. You may want to also limit your fluids to four ounces per meal or sip the fluids that are either hypoosmolar or isotonic throughout the day. Do not try and gulp your fluids. Sipping is better and sipping throughout the day works best. And most importantly, enjoy your meals with family and friends. Yes, we eat for nutrition, and obviously I think nutrition is important, but it's also social, and that's time to spend with your family and your friends. So is it okay to cheat? Like I said, I'm pretty liberal, and I think it is okay to cheat, but you have to be smart about it. So I think it's fine to taste your favorite foods, okay? so. You can have a regular soda pop if you have it with a salt pretzel. You know, one of those soft pretzels that have the large salt granules on it because the complex carbohydrate in the pretzel and the salt will um, minimize the output. But again, just sampling the soda pop, you can't drink the entire two liter bottle. And, you know, I've had patients call me and say, you know, my daughter's getting married. Can I have a piece of the wedding cake? Well, I think that's a pretty special occasion. Yes, but it needs to be a small piece. You can't eat the whole cake. So if you're going to try something, make sure you're close to a bathroom. And I've had patients who had that favorite food. And um, yeah, I had one lady who loved Dairy Queen um, ice cream. And she would allow herself to have one every month, but she made sure she was very close to a bathroom, okay? So sample your foods, don't overindulge. It is a dose response. So you might be able to tolerate small amounts of your favorite forbidden food, okay? So maybe you could have a little tiny piece of cake, but you can't have the whole thing. So yes, it's okay to cheat, but you need to be very careful about that. Limit the amount and make sure you're close to a bathroom. 
So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the takeaway message, diet is the foundation of therapy for short bowel. Fluid and nutrient absorption can be enhanced when oral intake is based on the GI anatomy. So it's a little different whether you have a colon in circuit or you have an ostomy, but, and there's a lot of variation. So you may be able to tolerate more than the person sitting next to you. I've um, provided some additional references in case you all want to read more. And on behalf of all my colleagues at the Brody School of Medicine, I thank you for your very kind attention. And I was just thrilled that I could get in <laughs> and speak to you today. Thank you.